guys, Steve Welch here with your uh, Tales of a Car Guy on my uh, Toyota channel, my Fact of the Day channel here. Um, I had a couple people ask me this, so why not? So, uh, question was, uh, what did I do exactly at the airline? <laughs> I, I've told a few stories about uh, some of the stuff that happened there, but true, I haven't actually told a whole lot about what I actually was employed to do there. <laughs> so, let's talk about that, right? So. First off, uh, how I got hired there was actually very interesting. So um, I was going to college um, and it was a technical school and that technical school's whole idea was to get you ready to learn how to work on airplanes, which is what I wanted to do. Um, that was my whole, as far as I could see forward in my future, that's what I was gonna do, is work on airplanes. Um, I just wanted to be around them, always liked airplanes. It's just something that, uh, oh, something that I liked, right? So I started to go to that school. I had a professor that was there and, and, and he'd do assignments and stuff. And I was always very particular on, on how I, you know, would fix stuff, how I put stuff together or stuff like that. And just, you know, there's a lot of hands-on stuff that you would do at that school. Well, he told me to stay after one day and uh, he told me that I shouldn't be in the school. So of course I was, kind of obsessed. I thought I was doing pretty good. What's uh, what's the issue, right? And he goes, "No, it's not it's not that you're not doing good. It's that there's there's not a whole lot I feel like I can progress you in the the way you want to go." And I said, like, "Okay. Well, what what do you suggest I do?" And he said, "Here, this is my wife's phone number." Which <laughs> initially like, "What?" Um, but he goes, "No, this is my wife's phone number. She is uh, one of the upper level HR people at the airline. And I was like, oh, okay. He said, you have an interview with her tomorrow at 10 a.m. Don't be late and uh, good luck. And I was like, okay, uh, that's pretty awesome. So I went to the interview and of course I, I knocked it out of the park because that's that's what I do, right? Um, so I, I, you know, yeah, I was pretty excited that uh, She's basically like, okay, so this was a Friday, right? And she goes, okay, well, we'll see you on Monday. And I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, we're going to finish all your paperwork now, and we'll see you on Monday. I got my secretary's going to help you to finish everything up, and we'll see you then. I'm like, okay. Um, I mean, I was I was floored. I was like, I'm, I'm going to work for a major airline. I just went down here to learn. You know, this is pretty sweet, right? So that Monday comes by and I obviously I go to her office and, and they kind of do some onboarding stuff and things like that and uh, she goes well here's this is your shop number and here's a map on how to get to your shop and I'm like oh, okay I, I need a map yeah you need a map okay so she's you know drawing it out like you're getting directions to your hotel room right I'm like okay so I, I walk in there and I find find my shop my shop was the paint and fiberglass shop so I look around and, and I kind of walk in there and I'm in there for like 10 minutes for anybody who says anything to me, right? Keep in mind, this is all prior to, to 9-11, right? So um, I, I just, it was a little different than that, right? So that being said, I'm just walking around and, and looking at some, I'm just like, hey, um, and they have, are you Steve Welch? She said, yeah. She says, oh, you're with me. Come on. I'm like, okay. So it, it turned out that was the supervisor, right? And I'm like, okay, so cool. So I was um, pretty happy to be there, right? So um, so what I ended up doing was I, I sat with the supervisor and I looked, you know, looked around and, and they, they brought me out there. Just, you know, they, they, they just, they, they called over a, another, uh, another person that worked there, right? And they said, hey, he's gonna be with you, show him around. Okay, so I just, I go and I, I go with him and I see all this, I mean, these, these parts, some of these parts were, were taller than I was, right? Some of these parts were, I mean, it's, you know, smaller than your fist. I mean, it, it was just a, a range of stuff that, you know, you look at it and you know it goes on an airplane, but you, for the life, you can't picture where. It's that kind of stuff, right? So, um, and it's not, and, and it really didn't matter where. It was better the repair. Now, um, some of them would have absolutely no problems, right? So I would sand them and, and you'd look at them and, and you'd tap them and I'll, I'll do a video on what tapping is later. Um, but you'd look at them, you tap them, you just, yeah, there's there's no issues. You 
you know, put it back into the paint, they paint it, then it goes back out, right? Well, keep in mind that you don't just do one job. So there was times that I was actually painting, got really good at actually painting. Um, and then uh, there was times that I was doing full on layups, full on just, just changing out the honeycomb because it made damage. Um, like I said, it just all depended on what needed to be done. But anything that was part of the airplane that wasn't metal on the outside of the airplane, I worked on. So um, the wing fillets that were the where the wing uh, comes together with the fuselage, um, that we would do that. We would uh, fix those things. We would um, look at uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, any panels that were like access panels. Um, the radome, which is the, the nose cone, worked on those. Um, the, uh, I mean, flap track fairings. So the fairings that cover over the metal flap tracks and, you know, hide all that, keep that uh, um, all aerodynamic, you know, tail piece of tails things things like that so just anything that was i mean and it's all exposed to 400 mile an hour 500 mile an hour winds right so um depending on the plane right so i was working on all of that stuff extremely important and i took it extremely seriously for anything that i worked on right so now the the airline like most airlines was a union shop so um anything that happened you, the supervisors weren't really in all that much control over what you did um, and I know it sounds weird but um, if you wanted to go to a different shop you had to bid it and the person that had the most seniority got to go to that shop um, and then vice versa if they were saying and you know in early 2000s they had uh, actually early 2000 they had a reduction in force so they laid off a few people well I was lucky enough not to be laid off but they had to adjust where people were to fill in for the people that got laid off. Now, the thing to remember is that the people that got hired last were almost always in less desirable shops. I got lucky. I went into a desirable shop, but most of them would go into the shops that people were in a hurry to bid out of, um, if that makes sense. So um, they came to me and they gave me a transfer paperwork, and I'm like, I don't want to transfer <laughs> They're like, well, you don't don't have a choice. This is this is your new shop, and my new shop, which I went to the next day, and I was still happy to have a job, so I went there the next day, was the wheel shop. All right, this shop had no windows. <laughs> this this shop was in a corner. Um, it it was dingy. It was dirty. I mean, just think of wheels, right? It was not where I wanted to be, but I had a job to do, right? So it was actually an interesting job to say the least. It was just not where I wanted to be. But um, the, most people don't even realize that on the wheel halves, the wheel halves come up, or, or the wheels, they come apart in halves, let's put it that way. Um, and there's you know, 20, 30, 40 bolts that go through the wheels that hold them all together. So it's not like the, the tires where you see them go on a car where they stretch the tire around the rim and put it on there. You can't stretch these tires like that. It doesn't work that way. So what you do is you have one half on one side, one half on the other, and then you bolt them together. And, and there's all these bolts going on the outside ring of the, the tire, or of the rim, sorry. Um, but I would sandblast them. I would do things like that. Um, I would, uh, you know, you'd send them through an x-ray and look for cracks, things along those lines. Um, then one of the more tedious and by far most important jobs that I did there um, was checking the wheel bearings. So you'd have some wheel bearings that were like the size of your fist for like a front wheel on like an MD-80. Those things were like car wheel bearings. They're just... There's just not a whole lot of meat to them. They don't take a lot of strain, and they're not really, not really rolling that that long. To be quite honest with you, um, but if you got something like the the main landing gear, you know, wheel bearing off of an Airbus or off of a DC-10, I mean, these these things were, were massive wheel bearings, right? Um, for the side, I mean, they're they're like truck wheel bearing, like semi wheel bearings. I mean, they're they're you know, some of them even bigger than that, um, but. You know, I, and I'd worked with wheel bearings before and greased them and stuff like that. I never inspected them the way you had to inspect them at the airline. So you took them and you spun each roller in the wheel bearing. So you'd mark the first one and roll each, each all the way around until you looked at each one. If you had pitting in it, if you had even discoloration, like it had been warm, like, like really warm, 
you know, so like maybe it was low on grease or something like that and it got too hot, then you would literally take a hammer, bust, just, just boom, just, just hit it as hard as you could and make sure that wheel bearing could never be used again. Um, and then you'd throw it into the scrap metal bin. Um, but I mean, I would, I would, oddly enough, I would bust a few of them per shift, but there was not as many as you might think that had damage. As long as they were original quality, then you'd actually put them in a machine that would put the right amount of grease in them and you'd wrap them in wax paper. When you wrapped them in wax paper, then you could send them back to the airplane. Um, but each one was specific to the airplane and specific to the wheel. And if you replaced one, then you had to say, this is outer position left main you know, or something like that. You'd have to mark which position it was and you'd have to mark that it was new. Um, that way they would know that there was a new one. So you'd send them a full set of wheel bearings to put on the airplane. So the, the guys that were putting them on weren't the guys that were actually working on the parts. But the thing was, is you had quality control in the shop. So whatever shop you're in, you had quality control. And then you had quality control on the dock and you had the person that did the work, the person that saw the work, you know, afterwards with quality control. Then you had, they sh shipped it over to the dock <coughs> when they shipped it over to the dock, then um, you had that person would, would also look at it. You'd have quality control look at it before and after install and then the installers. You had a lot of people that looked at that part to make sure that hopefully it was a good part, All right? So, um, but yeah, I did that for I don't know, two months. <laughs> But I, I, I found it to be very important, obviously. So um, even though I didn't really want to be there, I, I, I did it, right? But they, the airline let everything kind of hash out to where after that little reduction in force happened to where everybody would kind of fall into wherever they were. That being said, so part of the way that the union rules work is that they could hire somebody from off the street to fill a job if there was nobody within the current company that wanted that job. So basically what they would do is they would take it and they would bid and, and they would say, okay, so we've got this shop with an available position, right? And they would put it out on a bid, bid screen. Everybody could see that there were bids available for it. So what you would do is you would bid that job and the person with the most seniority would get that job. Um, once, if there were no bids, then they would open it up to other facilities, then they would open it up to higher off the street, right? So that was just the way that they worked it. Well, everybody that was in the wheel shop pretty much was always checking the bid, the bid screens, right? So you could see if there was any bids that were available, right? Well, I found one and ended up going over to the seat shop, right? So um, that was actually pretty really interesting too so when i went to the seat shop i was like so happy that i got out of the wheel shop but there was so much more with the seat shop that i didn't know when i thought i had it figured out right so you get in there and you're you're taking these seats apart and there there's really not a, a lot to the seats i mean there's you know um i mean there's there's pieces and stuff like that but it, everything's thin those seats are pretty light which they're they're supposed to be i mean they're on an airplane right so they're supposed to be pretty light but um there's just not a whole lot to the seats. So, um, and by the way, they can be adjusted so they can recline further, but they choose not to, just so you know. They all recline to the same spot and you have little adjustments that you can do. But if you, and, and every once in a while you get some seat, seats in where you could tell that somebody was probably on a long flight and figured out how to fix it. <laughs> and it's, it's really not that hard, it's two wrenches. If you know what you're doing, you can do it pretty easily. Um, but you just move these jam nuts <laughs> and all of a sudden you got a full recline. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it won't go like a hundred percent, but it's, you know, you can get a lot more than what you get. Let's put it that way. Um, but that being said, but we would have to go through, we'd have to take all the cloth off of them. They would pressure wash them, uh, make sure that, you know, all the parts were in there and that. And it was, there, there was a lot more to a seat than what somebody thinks about when you're talking about an air, airplane, right? The mechanisms, the things like that, right? Um, there were some old planes that we had to cannibalize parts off of their old seats because, you know, the ones that got like flown to the desert, they would actually pull a bunch of the seats off because there were no replacement parts for the, for the seats because the manufacturer had gone out of business. So we would cannibalize a bunch of like pieces off of old seats for, you know, it, it's just, you know, take one off of one, put it on the other, as long as it was good, right? Um, so that being said, um, I, I didn't 
really overall like it, but I liked it better than the wheel shop. But uh, you always had to worry about what was in the seat back pockets too, because they set them full, nobody pulled anything out. You had to be very careful taking stuff out of the seat back, seat back pockets. Um, but anyway, so um, I, was, I was at the seat shop and then I had noticed that my old shop had been split into two and they made a second shop that was actually the Lav and Galley shop, um, which I know sounds sounds like, oh, Lav's, that, that's bathrooms, and it is, but um, it, it's not what you think. <laughs> so, all right, so what it was is that, and I bid on it, and I got that job because people thought the same way, but I knew better because I had known somebody that was in the old Lav and Galley shop. So what the galley is, is that's where they prepare all your food. So there's, you know, coffee and stuff. And yeah, it can be, you know, there's grounds and stuff that, that get into spots they shouldn't get into. And those flight attendants beat the crap out of the the, the, uh, the counter where the head is. They, they yeah, they're, they're mean to those. So we'd, we'd have to fix those a lot and make it all nice and pretty just to know they're going to destroy it again. But it is what it is. They're just busting ice on them. That's what they're doing. But anyway, well, but yeah, they can destroy those good. Um, but anyway, so I was in the, that, the Lav and Galley shop. So that Lav, the Lav and Galleys, they, they take the, like the toilet out. They're, the toilet's a separate module in itself. So the Lav itself doesn't have a toilet in it. So all you're dealing with is the walls and the roof of the, um, and it's not really even the roof, but it, the, the panel that's up there. But you're, you're dealing with that, the mirror, the, the baby station, it, the door. You're, you're dealing with those things. You're not dealing with the, the potty part of it, the toilet part of it. So it's really just fiberglass work, right? Because it's all fiberglass. So, um, and then the, the galleys, same thing. And then you would actually put vinyl on it, which was like uh, wallpaper. And I'll show you the tool coming up in a, I'm going to do a, a video about tools that I used only at the airline because um, it was good. But then you would actually use these, this burnishing tool and you'd make this uh, vinyl just look perfect, right? And it would look really good. So, um, and yeah, and then even the, the front the front closet would have a big piece of carpet on it that was with the airline insignia. It's really sweet. So anyway, but so I got back in the Lavin Galley shop and I stayed there for a, a good amount of time, right? Then I noticed that the wide body paint and fiberglass had a bid. Well, that's what I started with and that's really what I wanted to be in, right? So um, I went out there and I was, I was there for a while. So, I mean, I had, you know, plenty of seniority at the time. So I went out there and I, I stayed out there for a little while. So, um, so, so actually, so I was probably in the first paint fiberglass shop for about a year. I was in the wheel shop for about three months. I was in the seat shop for probably about two or three months, then went to the lab and galley and I was there for probably a year. And then I went to and then I saw a bid that came up for wide body paint and fiberglass. So the difference between narrow body and wide body is basically just the airplane you're working on. But um, the the um, but so so what they would consider a wide body is something like a DC ten, right? That's so basically if you got two aisles, it's considered a wide body. They threw a couple of the the ones with one aisle in there, but like a seven fifty seven. They, they still kind of considered that a bigger airplane, so they would throw that in there. So you had more parts off of wide body, stuff like that. So I went over there, right? And I, I, I saw that bid for, for them, and I, I went over there in a heartbeat, right? And I got to spend the last, what, two and a half years, almost three years, that I was there working in wide body. Um, and I got laid off a couple years, actually, after the planes hit. Um, so I was actually working for the airline when the planes hit, hit the towers, right? Um, and it's something that I'll never forget being, you know, that close to, to that, even though I was extremely far away. I was, it, I wasn't as far away as, as some people that, you know, didn't work on planes every day, right? So, um, but it, it didn't take too long after that, that they started laying people off and I, 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 didn't know if they were going to get to me, um, but I was in the last wave of layoffs, and uh, it just, it's, it, I mean, 
it sucked, right? It, it was it was bad. I, I didn't want to go anywhere. I I would have stayed at that. I, I would have stayed at the airline until I retired. Without fail, I would have stayed at the airline until I retired. Um, so, but and realistically, I'd, I'd have been eligible for it now, which is odd to think, but yeah. So, but I don't know. So I I jumped around a lot. So the the question, what did you do at the airline? I did all kinds of stuff and it wasn't just the fun stuff. I, I actually worked. Um, <laughs> um, oh yeah. When I was in the initial paint and fiberglass shop, I actually was, um, I would cut, cut, um, um, the cargo liners, right? So cargo liners, they actually have a flexible piece of fiberglass that actually lays on the, on the outside of the cargo liners to try to protect the cargo area. And everybody that tried to cut those things would get the fiberglass embedded in their skin and would just itch so hard so you'd see people walking out there looking like they were ready for war and it never bothered me so they would be like hey you want to go do that sure you know it was easier my job was done quicker and it's like yeah i'll do that no problem so i'll go out there and i would do it and i would have them all done pretty quick and yeah it was, it was not, not a hard thing to do so um but uh yeah so Anyway, so came came down to um, wide body paint and fiberglass was the last spot that I was at working on. I mean, when the wide bodies parts were bigger than the narrow bodies, so I mean, some of those parts were as big as a car. Um, but um, you know, full on, and I, and I I would even take parts that that looked like they were destroyed and make them new, and that always was a point of great pride with me to be able to take something that everybody saw said couldn't be fixed and show them that it could and I took a lot of pride in that I just really enjoyed it um, and it was probably one of the most interesting jobs that I've ever had in my life and all it all came down to one professor and this kind of goes to show you so no matter what job you're in but especially if you're a teacher especially if you're a teacher, that one professor that went, you know what, you, you don't belong here and made, made me feel initially like he was going to kick me out of school because I did something wrong. But he's saying, you, you don't, you don't belong here. You've got better things for you. And he put me into that position by just giving me his wife's phone number and, and talking to her. I said, yeah, you got an interview at 10. Go talk to my wife. Wow. I mean, that literally that man did the one thing that most teachers say they want to do and he changed my life literally so I mean I went from I mean I was at the point that I was going to school I was going to school and working security at the airport because that was back before you know they had you know uh, TSA the, so I was working security at the airport for um, a private security company that was paid by Southwest Airlines to secure their terminal that's if that tells you you know how it used to be done that yeah my my paycheck was indirectly from southwest airlines so and i was not working for southwest by the way but my the initial paycheck was that way it was just kind of interesting but um but uh yeah it's interesting but uh he, he took me from that job where I was making, oddly enough, making $7 an hour. I still remember it was my first job. I was making seven and a quarter an hour. That was minimum wage. So I was making seven and a quarter an hour and I went to him. Uh, and so I was making seven and a quarter an hour and I went to the airline and I was making nine. And I was in heaven, $2 an hour. Woo! Uh, <laughs> but I got raises in it and the raises came pretty quick. And I will credit the union for, you know, get, getting the raises pretty quick. Although I think I could have probably got them quicker because I was a good worker. I could have probably got them quicker on my own uh, just based off of merit. But that's that's what I think. But the union did get some chunky raises and back pay and stuff like that. So they, they did help. I mean, I got, you know, a, a pretty substantial check after a contract was done. And when I say substantial, I mean, it was, it, it was more money I'd seen on one check ever. <laughs> Which, keep in mind, making $9 an hour wasn't hard to do. But, yeah, that, that extra bonus check was pretty darn good. So, um, but realistically, I, I had a really good time working for the airline. But uh, it's not as easy of a question to answer when you go, hey, what would you do over there? I did a lot. <laughs> I did a whole lot. Had a lot of fun met a lot of really cool people anybody that knows me from the airline you know you guys know that uh 
I, I yeah, it, it was just something we all we all enjoyed each other's company. We never missed a break. We <laughs> we break time. All right, let's go. Everybody stop. Yeah, so <laughs> but we we never missed a break. We also never had anybody that had an issue with their work. Basically meaning that nobody that I specifically worked with in any of those shops, if basically if let, let's say that a wheel failed, right? Because of whatever, you can cause obviously major damage, injury, stuff like that. That never happened with anybody that I know of that I worked with. The, the seat shop, obviously if you have something that's left in a seat that can hurt somebody, obviously, you know, those types of things, never happen, right? And then if uh, you get to all these paint and fiberglass shops, I mean, if you don't do the repair right and you have literal pieces fall off of the airplane, you talk about a problem. You have to have pride in your work and not just to go, oh, it's pretty. Because be quite honest to you, I'd, I'd rather it not be pretty and be good as opposed to being pretty and being wrong. Because you can make something pretty and you can repair it wrong. So they were very, very good at making sure, which they have to be, right? But very, very good at making sure that procedures were right, the way that you did things were right, and the standards were extremely clear and followed. So you might say union shop, people get away with murder. You're right. You can get away with a lot of stuff in a union shop. Nobody let the quality of their work suffer, even if their timeliness of it did. <laughs> I will say that. But I, I, never, I never saw anybody out there that went, nah, I'm not flying on that plane. Or I don't care about that job. Or, you know, it's close enough. Nobody did that, so um, I, I and I, I would, I'd probably wager a pretty good amount of money that most airlines are that way. There's at least enough people in the chain that'll call you on it, at least, right? So, but that, that's the easiest way that I can answer a very long answer to a very short question. So, but tales of a car guy. Steve Welch here, guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that, but uh, kind of looking back at uh, at what I did at the airline, it uh, brings back a bunch of memories just kind of thinking about it. But uh, yeah, it's pretty sweet. You guys have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Definitely like, subscribe. Have a good one.